Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Kelly D'Amico and I'm a marketing specialist at Threat Connect. I'm going to take a few minutes to go over some housekeeping items and the agenda and then I'll introduce today's speaker. First, I want to let you know that everyone's phone lines are muted to keep background noise to a minimum. If you have questions, please ask them by typing into the chat feature on your webinar console. We will answer questions at the end of the webinar. Please take advantage of the handouts available on the webinar console as well. Second, the webinar is being recorded today. We will be sending out the recording as soon as we have it available. Now for the agenda. T today we're talking about how every organization can use threat intelligence to better protect themselves. We'll begin with how to determine the best fit for threat intelligence in your organization, and we'll discuss how to find or create actionable threat intelligence. We'll then talk about how threat intelligence can fuel automation and orchestration, and how to manage risk with threat intelligence. We'll end with our Q&A. So now I'll introduce today's speaker. Andy Pendergast is the VP of Product and co-founder of ThreatConnect. He has more than 15 years of experience working in the intelligence and computer network defense communities from within the US DOD and Fortune 500 companies. So that's it for me. Now I'll turn it over to Andy. Thank you very much, Kelly. And thank you everyone for joining us this morning or this afternoon, if uh, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. So um, Kelly just went through the agenda, uh, just some you know, specific bullets that we'll hit as we go through. Uh, we'll discuss how you as an organization, if you're just getting started, can begin to use threat intelligence um, and also leverage that for driving automation orchestration or enabling proactive threat hunting, threat hunting and informing risk priorities. Before we dive into all of that, though, um, I always find it necessary whenever we're, we're talking about threat intelligence to, to first define what we mean by the term threat intelligence, as there is a lot of market confusion on what is and is not considered intelligence. I, I like to use, instead of using my own definition to start, I like to use uh, two well-respected uh, industry analyst organizations, Gartner and Forrester, and their definitions, which are quite similar um, and in line with each other. Uh, in particularly, uh, I like to point out that uh, they both define intelligence as knowledge of threats that can be used to inform decisions, and then Forrester adds in the uh, uh, addition of informing business decisions um, regarding risks. So um, while these are very good definitions, um, they are a bit wordy. So um, I also like to distill these down a little bit more uh, to say that threat intelligence is knowledge of threats that you can use to defend yourself or to get it down to just four words, it's actionable knowledge of threats. Now, if you noticed, uh, I consistently use the word knowledge, um, and that is different than data or even information. So I, if I can borrow from a well-established uh, hierarchy um, uh, known as DIKW, which normally stands for data, information, knowledge, and wisdom, and modify that a bit to DIKI, data, information, knowledge, intelligence. Uh, you can use this as a tool to differentiate uh, what sort of data or whether you're looking at data, information, knowledge, or intelligence. Um, data at the very bottom of the pyramid, as you see here, uh, is effectively signal, right? There's, there's no contextualization. There's um, no knowledge based in the data that has to be derived um, through analytics or basically just asking questions and correlating it across other data sources um, to create information. So a good example of data in, in an operational context would be um, we see a lot of login attempts uh, coming through your logs um, from a, you know, a similar IP address or the same IP address in, uh, in a, a large range. Um, information would be 
uh, contextualization of, of those IP addresses. Well, you can tell that those IP addresses are all coming from a country that you don't expect logins to come in from. Um, to take that up to one level above, knowledge is, uh, I see that those IP addresses coming in from a country that I don't expect are um, coming in at a very high periodicity, and I, through my past experience, can recognize that this looks like a credential stuffing attack um, where uh, someone is basically running a dictionary attack, trying to log into either customer accounts or, or um, employee accounts. With that knowledge, I can actually use that to make a decision, to take action, to either uh, check the accounts, you know, to see if there were any successful attempts, notify the user, perhaps um, take some action against those offending IP addresses that are coming in. The reason we uh, take so much time, or I take so much time to differentiate this is because of the market confusion. You can um, go and effectively buy data that's packaged as intelligence today on the market without actually you know, having the ability or having enough context within it to make decisions around. And that is a discriminating factor between um, what might be marketed as a threat intelligence and what is actually threat intelligence. Okay, so now that we've established a baseline of what threat intelligence is, why should you bother with it? What value does it provide? Um, and I, I break this down actually across um, operational, strategic, or sorry, operational, tactical, and strategic benefits. Um, so at the operational level, it can help enhance prevention and detection. This usually comes in the form of uh, indicators of compromise or observables um, that you can use to uh, enhance uh, detection in a SIM product or perhaps a firewall or endpoint device. Um, you can leverage it to correlate logs uh, to add, to enrich them as well. Um, at a more tactical level, knowledge of uh, your threat space and adversaries within it and the uh, attack patterns or tactics, techniques, and procedures that they leverage can help your response time. Um, and uh, enable hunting. If you understand where the adversaries are likely to go next in an intrusion um, and they've gotten in your network, then you can shorten your uh, time just by asking informed questions of where they might have gone next or where they were before so you can track down the root cause. Um, similarly with hunting, if you're looking for threats before uh, detection uh, occurs, and you can model out what their attack patterns may have been and what um, capabilities they're using in terms of tools or exploits to find uh, malicious activity that you normally would not have found. At the more strategic level, you can use this knowledge, this intelligence, to inform security policy. If you understand threat capabilities in your threat space, you may be able to prioritize um, uh, vulnerability patching, you may be able to decide uh, in a more informed manner where you should apply your security budget based on uh, your own crown jewel assessment, your own assets assessments against um, what the threat capabilities are against uh, towards those, those crown jewels. So, Knowing this, different teams have different needs. And you will need to make decisions based on your threat landscape, your own uh, security team's maturity, what your risk tolerance is, and some hard decisions uh, with, within the reality of your team size and budget that you have uh, to execute on. Um, one thing, and we'll hit this in a couple more slides, that is critical to, to that decision-making process is determining what your threat intelligence requirements are. Um, and then looking at whether or not you have more strategic or tactical uh, needs for leveraging threat intelligence. Um, you can start using threat intelligence as 
something you bring into the organization to help drive decision making. But as you grow in maturity, um, you can begin to look at threat intelligence more as a process that you do, not just something that you use. And we'll drive into this a little bit more as well. So if you look at the, the landscape of available intelligence, uh, both external, you know, out in the market, uh, provided by government groups. Oops. Let's fix that here. Pardon that. Um, if you look at the uh, available sources of intelligence out in the market, um, as well as your internal sources, there's a wide variety. And you'll need to vet, based on what your needs are, what sources you are going to take in. Um, so some examples of sources that I have listed here are uh, you know, internal sensors. Um, if you are doing IR, uh, if you have an IR team or and you're capturing artifacts, those artifacts are uh, really the raw materials for distilling and creating some of the most valuable intelligence you can have. Uh, similarly, you may, you know, through the process of threat hunting, you may actually find real threats or identify um, weaknesses in the environment that can be used to inform strategic policies. Um, looking on the external side, uh, obviously there's uh, vendor supplied intelligence, but also many governments today are providing uh, key industries and partners with uh, intelligence um, th themselves and you can also participate in any numerous either uh, vertical vertically aligned or threat space aligned sharing groups and ISACs and communities and there's lots of free stuff out there as well uh, with open source feeds or other sources of intelligence so with all of that um, how should how should you look at deciding which sources of intelligence you should leverage within your organization. Some uh, ways that we contextualize the sources are uh, by types of threats covered. Are, are these topically relevant to my organization? Do they cover threats that are in my threat space that I care about? Uh, veracity, can I trust it? Right? Are they always sending me half valid information? Um, or weak analysis? Uh, or is it a solid source? Um, is there sufficient coverage of the relevant threats? They may, uh, the source may provide relevant information, but only one sliver of it uh, is, is useful to you. Um, timeliness, am I getting it in a uh, timely manner, or is it always coming two months late uh, after everyone else has already reported on or after the campaign is finished and there's, there's nothing else to do but clean up? Um, is the type of variety of data actually useful to me operationally? Are they providing me a feed of IP addresses that I simply cannot use uh, operationally based on my technology? Um, structure, is it machine readable threat intelligence? Uh, is there an API available, especially this is especially relevant for external sources, uh, or does the uh, intelligence all come in the form of PDF reports that my analysts can read, but aren't immediately uh, available to be applied into my security controls. Um, and then context. Is there sufficient context to make decisions off of? And that gets right back to the point of determining with what you're getting is data information or more refined intelligence. So, with the broad landscape of intelligence available to you, one of the first things that we always recommend is for organizations to take some time to define their intelligence requirements. Uh, and this is a process. It's a process that you're likely not going to get 100% right the first time, um, but as you iterate through it um, and ask key stakeholders um, you know, what their concerns are, et cetera, you will get better at this every time you do it and uh, be able to get more value out of any intelligence source, internal or external, um, even after the first time. Um, if you do not do it, you risk 
uh, purchasing or acquiring intelligence sources that are not immediately useful to you or 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 at best partial partially useful to you so um, and there are many resources on uh, openly available on how best to establish your intelligence requirements however I see it you know, with organizations that we begin working with it is one of the most commonly overlooked uh, parts of the process of determining what intelligence needs the organization has um, so actually mapping out what are my organization's critical business operations um, and it you know a lot of people don't like to admit that there's there's ignorance here or everything's implied actually taking the time to write that out um, interviewing key stakeholders um, etc will almost certainly be an enlightening process in of itself um, and then from those discussions uh, you can map um, threats that are likely uh, or have a likely uh, potential to impact those business operations um, you can leverage many internal sources for this uh, records of past incidents uh, known geographic threats and uh, attacker motivations and techniques can help align uh, your intelligence requirements to the business needs. Um, and as you distill those, they should take on the form of questions that you need your intelligence sources to provide answers to. And you can use these intelligence requirements on an ongoing basis to vet and grade those sources of intelligence and switch out those that aren't um, answering questions as you need them to. Okay, so once you've established some intelligence requirements, you, you know, perhaps you've made some investments in uh, using threat intelligence, um, the next logical step is becoming a doer of threat intelligence. Uh, applying threat intelligence as a process in, instead of just something that you're bringing in from external sources. This often feels like a daunting task, um, but even just at the analyst level, uh, it is not as, uh, not as impassable a uh, journey to begin as it may seem. Um, if you already have an IR team or an IR function within your security team, this is actually quite easy. Uh, you can begin just storing the artifacts of those investigations for future knowledge and correlation. Um, it may be that you see a pattern of attacks that you can correlate. Um, separately, you shouldn't stop the investigation at the network boundary. If you begin to take a proactive stance um, and simply looking outside of your network for additional uh, artifacts, indicators of compromise, um, understanding of uh, the infrastructure and capability um, that was observed in an incident, and then looking uh, in passive DNS, who is records, uh, malware repositories such as VirusTotal to begin to look at what other um, capabilities the same threat or similar threats have, you can then use those uh, observables as uh, operational threat intelligence to help enhance your detection for next time. And if you're uh, likely, you're also gaining an understanding of what the threat's overall capabilities and motives are uh, more so than you would just observing what happened inside of your network. But obviously, um, you can begin to correlate and look across your network for classes of threats. Um, and um, one, of the, one of the best starter threat intelligence tools is simply a, a search engine, right? The almighty Google being able to correlate what others know about uh, the threats that you're concerned about and what's openly available. So um, when you're ready to begin actually you know, 
beyond just putting your toe in the water and doing some ad hoc research that you can start with to maybe prove value, um, actually establishing a strategically driven threat intelligence program does take some effort. Um, we help organizations model programs uh, across the intelligence lifecycle. Uh, this is a long established within uh, the intelligence community um, process for determining uh, how intelligence should be collected, uh, processed, analyzed, produced, disseminated, while bringing feedback uh, along at each step of that process. It starts with um, defining your mission statement, which should be something easily derived from the conversations you had with key stakeholders already. Um, and if you notice, um, identifying intelligence requirements, or as they're called here, PIRs, priority intelligence requirements, is a key uh, step in the process of defining and establishing a, an intelligence-driven um, program. Um, then from there, identifying collection requirements that uh, support those intelligence requirements, and um, then also identifying the sources, again, uh, something that we discussed before that was you know, part of just getting started. From there, you need to define uh, how you will process and leverage those sources of information. Where can you introduce automation? Where can you, you know, create operational integrations or enrich the data uh, that's coming in uh, you know, if it's not immediately actionable so that it can be actionable? Finally, you need to define your deliverables. How are you supporting your internal customers um, of intelligence? If the, that intelligent or that customer may be the SOC, it may be the IR team, it may be the CISO or other key stakeholders in the organization. Um, and those deliverables may come in the fact in the form of regular intelligence briefings. They may come in the form of uh, feeds of observables to enhance detection in a SIM product or other product. Um, whatever they may be, laying them out and tying them back to the collection and intelligence requirements will allow you to track that programmatically. Um, and then collecting feedback across uh, those customers after dissemination uh, from those deliverables is also uh, a key piece of this process. So, um, using a reference from uh, G.I. Joe, uh, if, if, I'm not sure if everyone's watched that before, but you know, one of the key things they say in every episode is knowing is half the battle. So, if knowing is half the battle, and knowing is pretty much everything we've talked about in the webinar up to this point, uh, leveraging knowledge uh, to make decisions, what is the other half of the battle? According to G.I. Joe, it's red and blue lasers. Um, the way we see it is its operations. So intelligence should inform decision-making for operations. It is a supporting function of, uh, of operations within your security team. Um, and I think that's uh, more and more well understood across the industry. One thing that we often see missed is the other half of that, that operations can actually support intelligence uh, because operations are, are by definition contact with the adversary or the threat. Um, and from that contact, from that interaction, um, you can uh, pull out artifacts from IR investigations, uh, notable events um, relevant for intelligence that the TI function of the security team can use to pivot and grow uh, a graph of knowledge around threat infrastructure and capabilities, as well as better determine intent based on what uh, occurred during uh, during operations, right? During an IR investigation or, or in the course of an investigation. One thing that we've seen is uh, in, in practice, 
both in my previous lives as, a, as an analyst myself and across our team, is that automation of these processes is, is necessary, and I'd say increasingly necessary for this to scale, especially across enterprise environments. So how does Threat Connect help? Um, we have a, uh, a catalog of products that can meet organizations' needs wherever they may be on the spectrum of leveraging threat intelligence to actually uh, creating a strategically driven uh, intelligence program that can help at the operational, tactical, and strategic levels, um, everything from enhancing detection to informing security policy. Um, with TC Identify, uh, organizations can uh, begin leveraging the power of a threat intelligence platform uh, to help uh, or to enhance detection and prevention with um, over 100 aggregated sources and our own premium intelligence source bundled in uh, from our own threat intelligence team. Uh, TC Manage, organizations that are ready to begin automating external intelligence into their processes can do that uh, with an on-prem or dedicated cloud instance of Threat Connect. Uh, with TC Analyze, uh, organizations that have made an investment in a threat intelligence function within their security team to begin doing threat intelligence can uh, structure and create and disseminate uh, their intelligence as well as fuse it with external sources um, across their customers internal and sharing partners external uh, with uh, with TC analyze and then finally TC complete is um, the ability to automate processes around uh, threat intelligence creation and orchestrate the uh, use of that intelligence uh, across security controls um, to as well as pulling in uh, other functions of the team of the security team including the IR and SOC directly where they can create and leverage a knowledge store of past incidents that can be uh, immediately correlated in an automated fashion with the existing intelligence that's been pulled into Threat Connect. Okay. Uh, well, that, that concludes uh, the, the briefing portion of the webinar, and we can open it up for questions. Hey, thanks, Andy. Um, so we'll move on to questions. Uh, we had one question come through that I can go ahead and read, and um, audience members, if you guys think of anything, feel free to type them into the webinar console. Uh, first question is, uh, what are some vendors I can use for dark web monitoring and brand alerting? Sure, so um, we partner with many threat intelligence providers. One of the uh, value propositions of Threat Connect is that we work with most uh, intelligence vendors uh, to integrate their, their intelligence and fuse it with other sources of intelligence as well as internal intelligence created by the, uh, by the customer themselves. Um, and many of those vendors that are that we have partnerships with do focus on um, deep and dark web monitoring as well as and brand monitoring. Um, some of those include uh, Flashpoint, Intel 471, um, Digital Shadows, uh, are just to name a few. But you can also uh, check out our uh, Threat Connect Exchange on our website to see a complete list of vendors that operate in that space. Okay, great. Um, looks like we don't have any questions coming through right now. Uh, so we'll go ahead and say that's all the time we have for today. If you guys have any further questions, we'll reach out to you via email. As I said earlier, this webinar is being recorded and we'll be sending it out in the uh, final recording as soon as it's available. Just a reminder to go ahead and check the handouts on the webinar console as well for any additional information. I want to thank you all for attending and we hope to see you at our next Threat Connect webinar. Thank you.